Thank you. If we could have everyone resume the seats. Are we ready with our uh, webcasting? Video? All right, thank you. Our next speaker, who uh, I'm sure all of you know, or most of you know pretty well, was the organizer of this conference. He's one of our um, devoted staff members who works off-site most of the time. Uh, he is the international editor of numismatic literature for the American Numismatic Society. With a specialized background more in ancient numismatics, he has become much more interested in the early American field, having uh, co-curated the installation of the material that we put into the Federal Reserve Bank, which I hope all of you have had a chance to visit, our new neighbor just a few blocks down William Street. He is Oliver Hoover, and he's been working on a book on coinage and currency used in North America. And he will be addressing us on the iconography of the St. Patrick issues. Oliver. Although the iconography of the 17th century St. Patrick farthings and halfpence is very rich, it has rarely garnered serious attention from numismatists. And on the few occasions when it has, the results have often tended to be mixed. Because of this situation, a number of peculiar iconographic interpretations have evolved in the modern literature, as well as within the general lore of the series passed on by collectors. My original paper dealt with two specific interpretive problems of the iconography of King David and St. Patrick on the farthings and halfpence that appear with some regularity. But because of the shortness of the time limit for presentations, today I will only speak on the subject of the King David type. Those who may be interested in my views on the St. Patrick types as symbols of the Protestant ascendancy appropriated from Catholic sources, which Robert Heslip has already mentioned, uh, you'll have to wait and read about them in the final publication of the COAC. It is not infrequently claimed that the obverse type of King David playing the crowned harp on both denominations of the St. Patrick coinage was intended as a portrait of King Charles I, and that therefore the series must be dated to the 1640s. Or, if a restoration date is accepted, that the coinage was produced under Charles II to commemorate his deposed father. However, a close review of the iconography reveals very little that is distinctly Caroline in the King David type, suggesting that it was really intended to depict David as himself, rather than Charles I as David. It is interesting to note that while many of the 18th and early 19th century students of the St. Patrick coinage speculated that the coins were issued or were at least used by the Confederate Catholics in Kilkenny in the context of the Irish Revolt of 1641 to 1652, none of them seem to have seriously suggested that the David type was actually a portrait of Charles I prior to Edward Maris's publication of A Historical Sketch of the Coins of New Jersey in 1881. In this work, the author reported that, I have been fortunate in securing one of each of the different sizes in perfectly uninjured condition. In the figure representing King David kneeling, I recognized the features of Charles I. This view was later endorsed by Walter Breen in a 1968 Colonial Newsletter article, and at last canonized for American readers in his 1988 Complete Encyclopedia of U.S. and Colonial Coins. But is it true? Was the face of Charles I actually used for King David on the St. Patrick coinage? The king's head, which is only about five millimeters from beard tip to crown on the halfpence, and three millimeters on the farthings, is far too small to distinguish the facial features of Charles I. Thus, it seems most likely that the features recognized by Maris in the David type were the pointed beard and the shoulder-length hair 
rather than the details of the face. There can be little question that the hair and beard of Dave, the David figure on the halfpenny, as you can see at the top there, are reminiscent of some numismatic portraits of Charles I. But these same features also appear on the portraits of the king's European contemporaries, such as the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand III, uh, Georg Wilhelm, the Elector of Brandenburg, and many others. More importantly, a similar style of hair and beard is worn by a harp playing David on a Nuremberg 10 ducat Portugaloser of 1641. Since a portrait of Charles I is no more likely to appear on a gold multiple of Nuremberg than that of Ferdinand III is to be found on Irish coppers, it seems clear that the beard and hairstyle cannot be taken as personal identifiers of Charles I, but should instead be understood as generic elements of royal fashion in the first half of the 17th century. Also problematic for the portrait theory is the fact that the figure of King David on the St. Patrick farthing appears to have a different and fuller style of beard and lacks the shoulder length hair worn by the king on the halfpenny. The farthing type seems to represent King David in old age with thinning hair and long beard. A similar image of David appears later on the 18th century Salmenfenige of the Swiss city of Brugg, and probably derives from earlier artistic depictions, such as David playing the harp by Peter Paul Rubens, as you can see here. Breen attempted to support Maris's dubious portrait identification by citing a remarkable halfpenny pattern made by Nicholas Briot for Charles I. The shorter hairstyle and goatee treatment of the beard actually served to undercut the portrait argument. <laughs> King David appears to have longer hair on the halfpenny and a full beard on both denominations of the St. Patrick coinage. The main interest here for Breen must have been the radiate crown, which is indeed very similar to that worn by David on the St. Patrick coinage. However, Despite this similarity, there is no evidence that the portrait coins depicting Charles I wearing this form of crown ever saw circulation and therefore could have served as a model for David on the St. Patrick coinage. In any case, the radiate crown, also known as the Eastern crown or antique crown in heraldic terminology, like the beard and hairstyle, was not an attribute specific to Charles I, and therefore cannot be taken as proof that David was a representation of Charles I. As part of a continuing Renaissance tradition, dating back to the early days of the Quattrocento, Charles' contemporaries, King Felipe IV of Spain and Fernando II de Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, both had themselves depicted wearing radiate crowns on coins struck in their Italian possessions as indicators of their classical erudition. This form of crown was generally associated with antiquity because it frequently appeared on Roman coins that were avidly collected by early modern rulers. In the Roman Empire, Imperial portraits wearing radiate crowns were regularly used to indicate double value, as on the brass Dupondius, which was worth two copper asses, and the silver Antoninianus, which was worth two denarii. But it also became associated with debasement. The Antoninianus, introduced by the Emperor Caracalla in AD 213, was rated at two denarii, and yet it contained only 80% of the silver needed for this intrinsic value. Over the course of the third century, the silver content was increasingly reduced until the Antoninianus became a bill on coin. The fact that Charles I wears not only the radiate crown, but also the draped cloak of a Roman general 
clearly signals a Roman model, probably the Antoninianus, for this representation. All of his other numismatic portraits depict him in contemporary costume, often involving plate armor with a ruff or lace collar. In the case of the Brio pattern, the radiate crown may have been intended to signal the use of debased silver for the proposed halfpenny, lest unscrupulous individuals try to pass it off as sterling. The pattern specimens cited by Peck all have the appearance of silver, but specific gravities that point to the use of impure silver or base metal as a core. Perhaps most telling against the association between the radiate crowned portrait type of the Brio pattern and the King David of the St. Patrick coinage is the fact that this crown form was often connected not only with Roman antiquity, but with ancient times in general. As such, it was not uncommon for the kings of the biblical age to be depicted wearing a form of the radiate crown in 17th century art. And here are some examples. There's David playing the harp before Saul, and you can see the crown at the top there. Again, Solomon's got it here. Uh, Hezekiah has it as well. And again, we have David. As David was one of the greatest of these kings, it is not surprising that he appears wearing this crown in painting and medallic art, as well as on several series of European coins that also depict him with a harp and in a suspiciously similar pose to that found on the St. Patrick coinage. These include the silver Sommenfenige of the Swiss cities of Bern, Brugg, and Lenzburg in the period 1659 to 1775, and the gold quadrupla scudi d'oro and testoni of Pope Clement X, issued in 1673 and 1674. In short, the radiate crown is an expected attribute of David in the 17th century, and therefore cannot be taken to signal an intended portrait of Charles I on the St. Patrick coinage. More recently, a variant of the crown form argument has been resurrected by Michael Sharp. He suggests that the crown worn by David is actually a type known as a celestial or martyr's crown, and that it therefore identifies the figure as Charles I, whose execution by parliament in 1649 gave him holy martyr status among loyalists. Shortly after his death, a handkerchief soaked in his blood was said to excuse me, miraculously cure disease. And following the restoration in 1660, Charles was officially canonized as a saint by the Church of England. In fact, he became the last saint to be canonized by the Church of England. While this is an interesting idea, it founders on the fact that David's crown appears to be the radiate antique type that we have already mentioned, rather than the celestial type. Depictions of the celestial crown of Charles I in posthumous engravings and on a commemorative medal by John and Norbert Reutier clearly show that the rays of this crown type were regularly tipped with shining stars, a feature that is completely absent from David's crown on the St. Patrick coins. And you can see the stars up there, and I hope you can see the stars here. In fact, we shouldn't really expect a celestial crown on the St. Patrick coins. If it were present, it would send a peculiar message, since the wearer seems to look admiringly at the temporal crown that hovers above the harp. This would be an inversion of the usual martyr iconography for Charles I, typified by William Marshall's frontispiece for the first edition of the Icon Basilicae, 
a work of royalist propaganda, casting the king as a saintly, almost Christ-like figure, suffering at the hands of his own people. Marshall's allegorical masterpiece shows the king having discarded his temporal crown on the ground, holding a crown of thorns and looking up to a uh, celestial or martyr's crown above. It would be highly improper for a saint, upon attaining his heavenly reward, to set his gaze upon the trappings of earthly power. In 1987, Michael Hodder already cast serious doubt on the theory of Charles I as David by noting the close similarity of the depictions of David on the St. Patrick coinage to images of the biblical king on the Nuremberg Portugaloser and the Brugge Salmenfenig we have already seen. He further suggested that all of the image prop images probably derived from a common prototype. But this seems impossible since even the details of David on the two St. Patrick denominations do not agree. We've already mentioned the differences of the beard and hairstyle between the farthing and the halfpenny. The general arrangement of the King David type for both denominations seems to be roughly based on the Nuremberg Medal, in which David kneels playing the harp while gazing heavenward. On the Nuremberg piece, the object of his gaze is the te tetragrammaton of God's name, surrounded by rays of glory. You can see it up there. But on the St. Patrick coinage, this feature is replaced by a temporal crown, not entirely unlike the one that David wears on the Portugaloser. There's a somewhat similar look there. It may be that the decision to apply the brass splasher to the temporal crown on the St. Patrick coinage was made in emulation of the shining glory of God depicted on the Nuremberg piece, as the splasher makes the crown to shine in its own way. The checkerboard floor below David on the halfpenny uh, also appears to be taken directly from the Nuremberg medal, as Hodder has already pointed out. But the form of the king's clothing closely follows that of David on the Swiss Salmonfenige. On both coins, the king wears a cape with a noticeable upturning at the end. You can see how it kind of flips up here, and you have it to some degree here as well. Uh, a fringe of ermine at the shoulder and along the edge of the cape. Uh, there it is on the shoulder, and here it is there. Um, if this were somewhat less worn, you would be able to see that this is, this is ermine here. Uh, this fringe here is also ermine, and you can see a bit of the patterning still. Uh, David wears a distinctive short tunic that reveals his lower leg and the pillow on which he kneels. Um, Here's the leg and the pillow. There's the leg and the pillow. Uh, also visible on the half penny and the salmon fenega is a calf length boot worn by the king. And there we go. And there we go. On the other hand, the St. Patrick farthings omit almost all of these details. Here the king still retains his cape, but the ermine has disappeared from the edge and the shoulder. There's, there's no indication that any of this is supposed to be ermine. Um, David also does not wear the short tunic of the half pence, but rather a long flowing robe that covers his lower extremities down to his ankle. This form of clothing is somewhat closer in style to that of the king on the Nuremberg Portugaloser and the papal quadruplus scudi and testoni, but neither of these can really be said to be a precise match to the farthing. On the Nuremberg piece, David's feet are covered and there is an ermine fringe at the shoulder. On the papal coin, the feet are visible and there is no ermine as on the farthing but the folds and cape of the robe are much more animated and the king faces to the right 
As an aside, we would add that the superior engraving technique and skillful Baroque treatment of David on the quadruple scudi and testoni should put to rest the old belief, which sometimes still resurfaces, that the St. Patrick coinage might have been produced by the Vatican as a means of subventing the Irish rebellion of 1641 to 1653. It seems improbable that the various Swiss, German, and papal coins that appear to have provided design elements for the St. Patrick's David type all could have been physically available to the designer of the farthings and halfpence. While it is true that the silver-starved Irish economy relied heavily on foreign coins, the Swiss Salmonfenige, Salmon which were produced largely as school prizes, are not likely to have circulated there. Nor does it seem likely that the rare 10 ducat Portugaloser of Nuremberg could have been easily pulled from circulation to provide a model for Irish coppers. Assuming that the farthing was produced as late as the 1670s, it is similarly unlikely that quadruple scudi or testoni of Pope Clement X would have been immediately at hand either. Although his predecessors, Gregory XIII and Innocent X, had financially supported Irish resistance to England during the Second Desmond Rebellion of 1579 to 1583 and the Irish Rebellion of 1641 and 1653, respectively, there is no hint that Clement X ever attempted to directly meddle in Anglo-Irish affairs during his brief pontificate and therefore little reason to expect his coins in Ireland. Indeed, to have interfered there in the period 1673 to 1674 would have been politically counterproductive since in 1673, James Stuart, brother of Charles II and his probable successor, had openly revealed his adherence to the Catholic faith. Since actual coins should probably be ruled out as the sources for the design elements used to construct the images of David for the St. Patrick farthings and halfpence, it seems likely that the designer of the coins had access to some sort of model book or books that included engraved images of the several European coin types or other artworks from which they were derived. Almost all of the iconographic elements found on the German, Swiss, and Papal coins as well as the St. Patrick series, appear in earlier works of art. David, dressed in the ermine-fringed robes of a contemporary medieval or early modern monarch, and gazing heavenward, can be traced back through the medium of manuscript illumination into the 15th century, if not earlier, indicating an iconographic tradition that was at least 200 years old by the time of the various David issues of the mid to late 1600s. It must be stressed, however, that the St. Patrick coinage is unique, if not daring, in its replacement of the glory of God or an angel that David traditionally looks up to with the temporal crown that serves to transform his harp into the badge of the Kingdom of Ireland. David's kneeling pose can also be dated to the 15th century, when it appears to have been developed as a conflation of two distinct iconographic types, that of the king playing the harp and the king at prayer. In earlier depictions, David usually plays his instrument in a seated rather than a kneeling position. Even the decoration of David's harp with a semi-nude winged female figure on the St. Patrick's coinage was ultimately inspired by an artistic tradition in which the harp was given a face and sometimes wings. This sort of embellishment was added to symbolize the harp's music, which had the power to drive out the demons that plagued King Saul. The head appears in painting and engravings of the 17th century and continued to be in vogue into the 18th century. Thus, a bearded head, somewhat akin to that found on the harp in Erasmus Quellen's David and Saul, can be found on the harp of the Nuremberg piece 
while the chubby head and wings of a puto appear in the art and on the Brugge Salmonfenige of the 18th century. The St. Patrick coinage charts a slightly different course by employing a full female figure, but its connection to contemporary models is unmistakable. Having now reviewed the several theories claiming that the image of David on the St. Patrick coinage is actually that of King Charles I, and looked at the contemporary artistic and numismatic evidence, in the end, it would seem that there is no iconographic indication that the Harper King is anyone other than King David as himself. Whether contemporary coin users may have interpreted the type as depicting Charles I is another matter entirely and cannot be addressed in the absence of documentary evidence. But if they did, there is absolutely no sign within David's typology that this was actually intended by the designer. Despite the short time that we have had, it is hoped that in some small way, like the great Irish saint whose most celebrated miracle was the driving of the snakes out of Ireland, we have at last managed to drive out an interpretive fallacy that has now bedeviled the coinage that bears his name for over a century. Thank you. Explicitly named as Charles I? Yes. Yeah. Did that ring a bell to you? No, it I, actually it doesn't, but uh, I'd be interested to see that. Yeah, um, I, looking at all the stuff I brought, I didn't. The, the article actually wasn't the greatest scholarly work. It was a few pages, but the picture was fascinating. It was Lynn Glazier, I think, maybe? Uh, I think it was Lynn Glazier. Yeah, I think it was Lynn Glazier. Yeah. Anyway, so that does ring a bell, but striking the similarities. You didn't run across that. No. no. We'll have to email you. Yeah, I'd be, inter I'd be interested to see that, yeah. It's, it's, po it's possible, but I think um, the, the Swiss pieces that seem to be uh, um, the, the primary models, um, they're so local in their production. I don't know, I don't know how much exposure um, they would have had, um, but it, it's... It's, it's certainly a, possi a possibility, uh, but I don't, I don't see that there's any way to know for certain. Yeah. Whether it's relevant or not, a lot of medieval Irish coin types actually derive from continental models and don't relate at all to uh, English ones, going right back to um, the John's Prince Farthings. And the most notable example is the the anonymous Edward IV Croats of 1460, mm -hmm. which used the large crown design, which appears in a number of places in Europe. I mean, the, the obvious source for coin types are those um, printed Dutch uh, exchange lists, and I, I, mean, I, I don't know them well enough to know whether they go into that sort of detail, but certainly when you look at in the back of, of um, 
Simon's plagiarised prior list, uh, in turn plagiarised from Sir Isaac Newton. It lists all sorts of uh, bizarre uh, foreign coins and their values. The other thing is that the, the last hoard I did, dealt with was a, was a group of, of coins from Liège, which are otherwise unknown in, in, in finds in the British Isles, as far as I know. So, the, you know, odd things do turn up. I mean, I, uh, in Carrick Fergus, there was a, there was a, a feudal uh, court day who turned up uh, as well. You know, so sort of, it's hard. I, I agree with you that the, that the balance of probability is that this comes from some other method. But, but every now and again, odd things do pop up in odd places. Yeah. <laughs> Okay.